Cool, so hi, I'm Megan. Uh, so I'm a part of the topographic data team uh, and we're in the location information business group at Land Information New Zealand. So in this presentation, what I'm going to talk about is the National Building Outlines data set that we've been working on uh, and how we've developed processes and tools using open source software to help us maintain and also build that data set. So to start with, with a bit of a use case, the building outlines have already been used in the Kaikoura earthquake response two years ago. So they were used to identify houses that were in the risk of a tsunami zone. Uh, and because of this, helicopters were able to land nearby and warn people of the potential dangers as well as to check that they were safe. And it was also used to identify the houses that were downstream of lakes that had formed uh, and that were at the risk of bursting. So when we were first looking into generating the data set, New Zealand didn't have a consistent one already in place. And this is something that we recognised would be extremely useful for a lot of different organisations and departments. So initially our project started with a very small uh, data, pilot data set in Timaru where our Topo 50 map sheet was coming up for review. Uh, we were very pleased with the outcome of this, so we built a larger pilot data set, which is what you can see behind me. So at the moment, it's got about 2.8 million building outlines in it, uh, and that's what you can see on the screen at the moment. So it's not a full extent, uh, but we are working towards that. So all of the outlines that we have are captured and aligned with the aerial imagery through the New Zealand Aerial Imagery Program, which is run throughout the summers. So that imagery data is already released and freely available on the LINS data service. Right, so to demonstrate the capabilities of the data set that we've been working on, what we're going to do is go back into the past uh, and look at Rongatai in Wellington uh, and also give you all a bit of a Wellington history lesson. So we chose this area because as you can see, the building outlines have changed quite dramatically over time. So the ones in 2016 are taken from the actual data set, but 1941 and 1975 were painstakingly hand digitized by the technical lead, Daniel, uh, just to show you what we can do with the data set. So looking at those three images, you can see if we were to just take the data that we've received and merge it, there'd be quite a few issues, a little bit like this. So it also shows that when we say 2.8 million building outlines, it doesn't reflect the amount that we've captured so far. So as some have been captured multiple times, two or three times in the process. So to future-proof our data set, always providing the users with the most recent outlines, but maintaining a persistent building outline ID so our users don't have to redo their processes each time we release a new data set, we had to come up with some extra steps to our QA. We also didn't want to release a data set with duplicate buildings in the same location. So to solve this, we separated the data sets into individual ones by the aerial imagery that they relate to. And then we process them, well, we still are processing them individually and in chronological order from oldest to newest. And in doing that, while we quality check them and compare them, we're building relationships between all the outlines throughout time. So this is the interesting part. So to deal with the overlaps, we have what we call the comparison and alter relationship steps of the building outline QA. So to start with, we can look at the comparison between 1941 and 1975. So firstly, looking between those two dates, you can see that the airport expanded from a grassy runway, and that happened in 1958. So in doing that, they not only had to remove all the houses, which the plugin has identified in red, uh, but they also had to remove the hills that were in the way too. So in our case, our plugin identifies removed buildings as those that don't overlap any incoming ones or only overlap by less than 5%. So both those houses and the hills were relocated to the northwest corner of the image and those are the ones that are highlighted in green. So again, all incoming buildings are those that don't overlap any existing ones or again only overlap by less than 5%. Then we have some interesting locations. So this, the red building was the centennial exhibition that we had in Wellington and it covered about 22,000 square metres. After it finished, it was used as extra accommodation during the Second World War, and then after that to store wool. Uh, it then burnt down by spontaneous combustion of the wool that was stored inside, and replacing it, they built an industrial area. So that represents most of the added and removed outlines of that area, but you can see that most of the ones that we have are in blue, and those represent a matched relationship. So a match is a one-to-one, 
Uh, so the buildings that have remained the same throughout time. So this is an example of while although the geometries have been updated and they've changed, if we were to release a new data set, the IDs for those buildings would remain constant. So once we're happy with the data, we can publish it to production and then begin the whole process again with the second data set. So with the data set between 1975 and the current one from 2016, there are still a number of new green building outlines. So this is just continued development of the waterfront region and you can also start to see some infilling of houses on the large sections down there. You can also see continued removal of buildings that are near the airport um, and that's continual process that's going on. There's also the introduction of a new relationship that we didn't see much of in the last comparison. That's related outlines. So there are buildings that have been split, that have been merged, that have also been split and merged. Uh, and we get the plugin to group all of these in, into the related classification. And then again, you can see the match buildings bringing through those IDs that we generated all the way back on the 1941 imagery and releasing it into the last data set. So this is, back to the slide at the beginning, what you see if you just look at the data at face value. But through developing our own tools and using open source software, we've been able to generate an image like this, which gives a lot more richness to the information that we've provided. So now into the technical side, how we did it. So we developed a plugin using QGIS and we manage our data in a database using Postgres and PostGIS. Using Sphinx and Read the Docs, we've been able to publish a data dictionary in all our documentation. All of our code, we store it on GitHub, and as a part of automatic testing, we use Travis. So, this is what the plugin looks like, and now I'll tell you a little bit about how it works. So the process that we start off with, obviously, includes loading the first data set. By creating what we call a capture source area, we're able to link our data sets and all our building outlines with the aerial imagery that they came from. So this gives us more information and it's how we're able to apply a date to those buildings, but it also provides the users with the imagery that those outlines relate to. Then we get to load the data set. So what we do when we load it is we also store a lot of additional information, so that capture source area, also a short description, the method that was used to capture those outlines, um, the external ID if one is provided, and also the organization that gave the outlines to us. Then, when we're doing the QA, so our QA includes a lot of different steps. Uh, some of them are fixing minor building overlaps, checking the overlaps with our coastline and hydrological data sets, uh, and checking a representative random sample. So when we do this, we have built scripts that automate the collection of all those outlines um, and using the building outlines plugin and also other ones that the team has previously built. Uh, but what we do is we do manually go through all those outlines. So we do have edge cases where, for example, buildings will fall outside the coastline, especially for like buildings on the edge of a wharf. So we do need to check them all. So this here is an example of how we just use existing QGIS functionality to make our processing a lot easier. So this is using the advanced digitizing panel just to make sure that all the building outlines that we add during QA have right angled corners, which is something that's quite important. So when we're happy with the QA of the bulk loaded data set, we press the compare button. And this extracts from the database any existing outlines that overlap with the new ones that we just loaded. So obviously for the first data set of each area, we recognize that all the outlines are new and we can just straight away publish them to production. But when we have the process of buildings that overlap, that's where we get that colorful screen you saw before with all the different relationships. Um, so what we do is we do QA all of those outlines um, and this is an example of why. So this is the alter relationship step of the QA and sometimes the plugin and the comparison step gets it wrong. Uh, so especially when say buildings have been removed and then new ones built in the same place. So you can get those buildings being picked up as related rather than added or removed. Um, and again, this is just an example of how we've taken existing QGIS functionality, just simple things like turning on and off the layers and also selecting mul multiple features, but just bringing it all into a plugin and making it more easy and accessible for us. Uh, and this frame has made the QA of these outlines extremely easier. 
So our code is in a database and it's in an open repository. Um, so that's the database code. Um, and you can go and check it out. The link's been covered there, but I can provide it later. Uh, and also we've got the descriptions of the tables and all the relationships in our data dictionary. So speaking of the data dictionary, this is some screenshots of what it looks like. Uh, and using Sphinx, we've been able to automatically update this data dictionary. So that means that each time we change the tables in our code, we can change them on the documentation as well. So that gives us a reliab reliability that we know that what we're providing everyone with the information is correct. On to testing. So using PGTAP, we have actually 193 tests on the database. And we also have 112 tests on the plugin itself, one of which you can see running in that GIF. So each time we make changes to the plugin, we write tests for that. And when we push those changes to GitHub, we use Travis to automatically run the tests on the database. That allows us more confidence in our processes, but also in the code itself. So getting to the end. When we release the data, which we're working towards doing, there will be two data sets that we release on the Linz data service under the same open license as the aerial imagery. So the first one is the one on this side, uh, and that is an outline set of all of the buildings, the current ones, that relate to the most recent imagery and their IDs. The other data set contains a full history of New Zealand's outlines from beginning to end of all the data that we've processed. So that allows people to still use the buildings that relate to the older imagery that we've got up on the site, but also it allows New Zealanders to start to build a picture of what the building outlines look like throughout history. It's a pretty quick one. Um, so if, if anyone's got any questions, fire away. Yeah? Uh, yeah? yeah. Uh, you're saying you go through, like, people actually sit there and physically inspect each and every one of the building outlines that's generated by the tool? Is so that right or is it just flagged by the system and say, check this area? So with the QA, um, the initial QA with the hydrological data sets and the coastlines and the random sample, uh, we check every single one of those. With mm -hmm. the relationships that are generated, we do have confidence in the matched ones. So we only check a sample of that and a sample of the related. But with the added ones, we have confidence that they've just been added, but we do check all of the removed ones, just to make sure that we're not removing any outlines. Just to be, we're yeah. not checking every single building in the entire data no. set. <laughs> the um, uh, tools that we've built around QA pick out the things that um, look problematic, and then uh, a random sample of the rest. So if there's 600,000 building outlines in the Auckland region, the grand total that are being checked might be about 600. So you'll get a lot of weird outlines with like tree shadows and trees over hands and all this kind of stuff, right? Is that the kind of stuff you would as well? Um, well, I mean, you can't really pick too many of them up. We haven't had that much of an issue with tree outlines and things like that. Um, we do have some issues with caravans being picked up, um, so we are working towards fixing all of those data sets, obviously it's very important. Um, but yet yeah, we <coughs> pick them up in the random sample and went through them. Do you have anything to say? So do you include like sheds and areas? So we classify buildings as things greater than 2 meters square. So yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I went through and added like 250 pig size that were all great. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're making sure we put a lot of effort into it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, are there any plans to apply this technique to other parts of the building environment um, or infrastructure networks? Might be a question for Daniel. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <coughs> With building outlines, definitely working towards getting full coverage of the country. Um, probably the first time we've built some sort of more temporary tools like this because we've, um, we're capturing this data off the back of the aerial imagery program. We're intending to continue to do that. Because um, I think, I mean, as you've seen in the presentation, over time it just gets so much richer information um, compared to getting that so, um, a 
as this gets fitted in, we might look at what other analysis like we can capture waterways automatically off the aerial imagery program as well, and do some work like with that. But at this stage, um, definitely working towards full coverage and um, we'll, yeah, see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, so the 1941 and 1975, are those full aerial coverage of all of New Zealand? So I guess the important thing to note is that was an example. So 1941 and 1975, that's all we've got that Daniel drew in. Um, it's to, because obviously we can't go into the future with imagery, but that's what will happen over time. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, I wanted to ask, like you mentioned that the ideas of the buildings are kept consistent. Mm -hmm. So if a building is destroyed and two new buildings are kept on, in that case, won't that ID be removed from the new data set that is created? So we have the buildings with the different classifications. So the ones that are matched and that we agree with, they carry through. Added buildings, they have a new ID that is <coughs> added to them at that point in time. And then the ones that have been removed, they have a, we end the lifespan of them. So in the final, the full history data set, those buildings that have been removed will still be in there, but they will have an attribute with a date of when we ended the lifespan of those buildings. Ah. Yeah. yeah. I'm interpreting with uh, some area we need to tell us about airport. Roughly how long does it take to run Um. So we did a lot, so that's why we've used a lot of postures functions, because they're a lot quicker, and a lot of spatial ind indexing, which helped us make it faster. Uh, we've been processing them at the moment. We haven't gone to Auckland, which is the biggest one. It's going to take a long time. Um, but I think it's been taking us to get through a data set maybe a day or two, so it's not too bad. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.